One of the most challenging things of doing this painting was actually the face. There's a lot of little minute details I was trying to capture and different changes of color in the fur, especially around the nose and between the eyes. The way I tried to tackle this is by applying a lot of different colors that I saw and then going over with strokes of color to get that fur appearance, similar to the rest of the body, but in smaller batches. There was a lot of little different colors and changes that I tried to capture. This is an area I would go back again and again. Plus I had to sculpt around and carve the dog's face. For all honesty, I actually do not have that much experience doing fur. I believe I only have one painting I've done in the past. So far it is, in a way, still a learning experience for me. But one thing I do is lay out colors I see and then go back into them. For the most part, I use a lot of tiny brushes to lay out those colors of hair. I wouldn't hold just one type of brush. In most situations, I would hold a variation of different sizes, ranging from 018 to 3. That way during the process, I can lay out thin lines and then if I have to, I could blur them with a thicker brush. Not all the hair is gonna be super detailed, especially the ones that are either in the shade, far away, or both. They're gonna have more of a softer appearance, but the ones that are more towards the viewer, they are definitely gonna be on the sharper side. One way to make the hair soft is very easy. Use a dry brush to smooth out the lines that you've laid in place and not use very sharp lines to begin with while painting. Wet on wet is usually the best way to go. And the reverse could be said about sharper lines where you could still do wet on wet, but the dry brushing, if you do use some, will be a lot more minimal. While painting the hair, I was paying attention to the lines and the direction of them because they help form the volume of the dog and the shape and body it has. Besides light and dark, which I will go more into later, the direction of the fur helps sculpt the dog, especially the way they wrap around the body. Of course, there's gonna be a few hairs that are out of place, but for the most part, they have a flow to them. Besides color, another thing I paid attention to is light and dark. And that's very important to carve out and sculpt the dog. So it's not just a big furry thing on the canvas. The goal is to give it the illusion of volume and have form in the end. So I looked at the light and dark and how there's different tones. On the side where there's shade, it'd be more on the bluish gray side and less contrast. And on the side where the sun would hit the dog, it was definitely a lot more brighter. And even though the sun was hitting the dog on its left side, there was still some darkness too I had to capture, especially where the folds were. In order to capture the form of the body and all the folds, you have to kind of envision how the dog would look without the hair. Because obviously the hair is blocking the view. But if you eliminate it from the picture and try to envision how the body would look, it makes it a lot easier to sculpt with light and dark. Yes, it is very tedious the way I do the hair, but to get the look I was trying to go for, which is a lot of detail, it was something I was willing to do and put the time and effort. This is not for everyone, but if you're striving for a sense of realism and you want to do pets or animals, you'll find fur, especially for up close paintings, to be very time consuming and tedious. But on the bright side, it's not about capturing each hair exactly how you see it in the photo. It's more about mimicking it and making it believable. While the right arm of the dog was quite easy for me, the left one posed a lot more of a challenge. And probably has to do with the dog itself because it actually had different fingernail colors. But I still attempted it the same as the other one where I try to emphasize the fingers and the nails and the way light and dark carved out the fingers. Plus part of the arm was enveloped in sunlight. Also as I laid out the hair on the arm, I tried to envision how it would wrap around the arm to create volume. Because one of the things you don't want in a painting is for something to look flat. And sometimes you have to use lines and color to show volume. Even if it means to exaggerate a little bit. Remember you're trying to create an illusion of 3D on a two dimensional surface. With that said, I always find it insulting when people say your paintings look like a photo. I'd rather them say, wow, that arm pops out. What I found very convenient is doing the highlights at the very end or closer to the end and also not to be afraid to go thicker. 
Also, depending on where the highlights are, they're gonna be a different color. Near the brown patch of hair, they are more of a orange white. But for the majority of the body, it's gonna be just a hint of orange. And there's other areas where the highlights are not actually gonna be orange at all, but more of a blue. And that's more where the body is in the shade. And in some areas, instead of orange, I would use yellow. It all depended on the location and how it would appear in the photo. But those highlights next to darks definitely make them pop out. And to enhance them, in some areas where I laid out some bright hairs, I would go back and lay some dark in between them. And if necessary, use a dry brush to either blur or smooth them out a little bit. Speaking of dry brush, another technique I would use is actually use a dry brush to move the paint in more directions. It doesn't make any sense, but imagine if there's a big gob of paint somewhere. You could actually use the brush more as a pushing tool. And I don't know if you caught it, but I even used a palette knife to push the paint around as well and create strokes of hair. I apologize in advance for the glare while filming the plant. But anyhow, one of the things I was trying to do while painting this tiny little plant grown out of the crack is separate the leaves with light and dark. I darkened underneath the leaves and used blizzard and crimson and viridian to get those darks so the leaves popped out. And I also outlined the leaves with a bright yellowish green. That way they stood out. But since it is in the shade, I didn't want it to stand out too much. But I did want to spend some time detailing it. The goal was really just to give the plant a sense of form and separate the leaves from each other. By the way, for my greens, I rarely use green out of the two. Usually it's a combination of a yellow or blue, cadmium yellow, cobalt blue, or cerulean blue. And sometimes I would use viridian in the mix. Ah, the ground. One important thing I want to say is I did not copy it exactly the way it was in the photo. I looked at the photo very carefully and I tried to visually feel how the pavement would be, the texture that is. As if I rubbed my hand on the canvas, it would feel the same as in real life. Based on that visual feel, I would try to create a pattern of lines of dark and light as well as dots. And then I tried to mimic that pattern and the repetition of it. But I would add some things for some variation that I did see in the photo, such as little rocks and the yellow paint. Again, I would use a dry brush to smooth out certain areas. And like the hair, it'd be an area that I would go back into again and again. One important thing is the closer to the viewing plane, the more detail I would add. And the further away, I would dry brush even more to smooth out those details so they did not stand out as much. Also contrast, more contrast up close and less towards the back. That way you could create a sense of distance and depth in the painting. I know I laid out the grass earlier on, but it was more like to get an idea of how it would appear. I didn't spend that much time on it. That's why, as you can see, I'm painting right over it to get the texture of the ground. There was no way I was gonna paint in between each grass blade. It's a lot easier to paint the grass again afterwards. And the good thing is, I didn't spend too much time detailing it. If you made it to the end, thank you for watching. More on the final touches on my next video. I always feel that last video is always on the boring side because it's little details I try to do in the end that actually require quite a lot of work. But it doesn't look like I did much in the end. Anyhow, check out also my Instagram if you want to see some of my finished paintings. Not your typical painter, of course. Once again, my name is Charalambos. I go by Bob. I am not your typical painter. Thanks for watching. Bye.